thank you very much for turning up, uh, talking about something that's sexy, innovation, and something that's a lot less sexy, regulation. Um, but I'll try to make it interesting. Um, first of all, I work for a company called Edgar Dunning Company. We're a global strategy firm in uh, payments consulting. We only do payments. And that's as much as I'm going to say about us. This isn't a sales presentation, but promise me you'll go back and look at this slide so you know who we are, okay? Other thing I should say before I start, people accuse me of having an American accent. I'm Danish, okay? So, just so you know that. What I'd like to talk about is the sort of digital commerce matrix, as we call it in our company, which is about the sort of payments in the mobile area, proximity, closeness, NFC, Apple Pay, that type of stuff. Digital remote, which is really what a lot of people are about here. And then the beyond payments, where do we go from just the exchange of value, if you want, and into a broader value proposition. But first I want to talk about the fundamentals of payments, because a lot of people talk about innovation and payments, but actually all payments, retail payments, run on two networks. One is the ACH network, that is direct debits and credit transfers that come in and out of your, your salary account, your current account or it runs on card system networks. And all the innovation we see around this are connecting to these two, but these are the backbone on which all the payments run. And what we see is sort of new ways to connect and new ways to access them, but it's still running on the same platform, which is, a, if you want, a constraint on innovation. So these two systems have two different value propositions. So the card payment system at the top here, because there's an authorization message that goes through, when you go into a store and present your card, the merchant receives a confirmation back that the payment is accepted. So he knows he's going to get his money. He's only going to get it 24 or 48 hours later, but he knows the money's coming through. With the typical ACH or clearinghouse payment, you raise a demand for money, it goes into a batch process, it hits your account during the night, and if there's no money, there's no money. The merchant doesn't get paid. So the payment guarantee is an essential element of the value proposition of a payment. But what we're now seeing is there is some innovation in the ACHs, and there's now called what's fast ACH, or near real time. It's still batch processed, but it's, near, it's like emails. They're batch processed, but they feel like they're real time. And if they arrive five minutes late, we're really irritated. But fast ACH works the same way, so you can actually in the UK now, which has implemented it, if I've got two different bank accounts with two banks. I can push money from one account, and before I switch over and update the screen on the other account, the money's in there. That's how fast, fast ACH is. So it's near real time. So with that, the merchant could now use an ACH payment to get the money in near real time, which is as good as getting a promise, an authorization message back. So it changes the value proposition of what you get from uh, an ACH. And when we look at the innovation, as we call it, all of these various innovative companies are all using either the card payment system or the ACH payment system to push the actual value exchange behind there. I should also mention, I put the brand Isis up there. They're going to be renamed Cardsoft next week, but they're still Isis today. Um, but if we run through some of those, PayPal everyone will know. Typically, when you open a PayPal account, they will ask for a card, and you put your credit card in or your debit card number. But if you try to open a PayPal wallet on your phone, they will ask for your bank account details. And once you give the bank account details, they will put the bank account transfer as the primary method of payment because it's much cheaper to use the ACH network than it is to use the cards network. What PayPal doesn't do is price it differently to the merchant. They just lower their own costs, right? But they, they have that um, forced choice and push it upon you. So you have to actively go in and say, no, actually, I want to use the card if you don't want to use your ACH or your bank account detail. But there's all kinds of other things that are going on there. Uh, Barclays Ping It is a P2P payment system that they innovated, and they're now trying to push it into uh, the, the retail payment sphere, trying to sign up merchants, utilities, and stuff. There's a, a good game called Ping It Pong, where if you have two or three of your friends,
try and send money in a circle, just one pound between you, and see how many times you can get it to go around in 10 minutes. Um, when you do that, it costs you nothing to send the money, but it costs Barclays a little bit every time you do it. So it's really fun if you don't like Barclays. Okay, so here's then the two systems that we have, the ACH and the cards companies. And around that, all these innovative uh, companies are sitting and doing payments that sit basically on these two platforms, but are presented differently to us. And in some senses, they look more sexy, they're more attractive, they're perhaps more socially uh, connected to what you're doing, if it's a sort of social networks or if it's through uh, the device provider like Apple Pay, it can be meaningful or more meaningful to you than using the traditional payments method. And around this, we're now seeing a lot more of innovation coming on. And what this is doing is using stuff beyond the actual payment but more of what we now begin to call big data, or people have called big data, and it's the information around the transaction that is now becoming a, a big, uh, a, a big uh, what should I say, business for people to do. So for example, Samsung as a device provider. There's a case in the UK now that's been raised um, because a, a consumer bought a Samsung smart, uh, smart TV, sorry, and to use the smart TV, he has to accept that Samsung are going to collect all kinds of personal data of whatever he surfs on that TV, and then they target him with specific marketing. And he's complained, it's wrong that I have to buy this product, and I cannot use it without my data being used to force adverts on me. Okay? So people are getting into these types of collecting information, the big data thing, to use it actively in marketing. So what's that got to do with regulation? Well, this is meant to be a tsunami wave because there's actually a lot of regulation going on in the world and a lot of it is around payments. So it started over 40 years ago in the USA that started looking at payments and payments regulation. France, Israel, EU, they've all gone through the payments uh, situation or the, the propositions and they've taken, typically looked at rules and practices um, to see whether they could open it up for more competition or whether it's anti-competitive or whether it's innovative enough. The four key areas of regulation that we've seen is data protection. So, for example, the EU have deemed the US to be an unsafe environment for EU citizens' personal data because the US allows all kinds of data mining to go on. So for a company like Visa and MasterCard, they have to be approved to process consumer data in the US in a way that is sufficiently secure for personal information according to EU rules. Marketplace regulatory barriers. This is access to joining the payment schemes. One of the, uh, or two of the rules that came out of that, or regulations, is e-money regulations and payments institution regulation, which you have recently adopted here in Turkey and put into force. This means that companies that are not banks can now become authorized entities to compete in the payment space and can join the payment schemes. So Visa, MasterCard, and any other scheme that operates in a country. Pricing and interchange. Um, so what is the cost of accepting payments? And there's a lot of regulation going on in that space. And when I say ancillary rules and product-specific regulation, these are things like the non-discrimination rule. So if you put a MasterCard sign up in your window as a shop, Someone comes in with a card that says MasterCard, you must accept it. You can't look at my card and say, oh, that's a Danish MasterCard, I don't like that one. You have to take it if it says MasterCard. So those types of rules, they've looked at as well. And then in Europe, we have the single European payment area. And that is the SEPA initiative, which is meant to integrate across the EU payments. But each country had its own regulation of payments that weren't compatible. So we've had to try and standardize the rules around payments in Europe with the objective of creating more choice for consumers and for businesses of schemes, processors, ensuring interoperability, uh, that there's more payment service providers, again, the e-money regulation, opening up access for other businesses to join, um, and to standardize the messaging that goes on so that you can actually send transaction messages from Germany, for example, to France, which previously you couldn't because they had different standards. 
But the interesting thing, and I like to use lawyers whenever I have to say something derogatory about people, but Hogan Lovells came up with this quote last year, and I think it's very uh, precise. The subject matter of the proposals is technically complex. This is proposals for regulating of payments in Europe. So it's technically complex and not always fully understood by those drafting the regulation. Okay? Which basically means they don't really know what they're doing, but they're going to do something to us with the regulation. This means that we as an industry must interact with our regulators when they start working on regulation of our industry. We can't just sit back and wait for, sit back and wait for it to happen because it invariably will be written by someone who doesn't understand it as well as we do. So we need to interact. So one of the regulations that's coming out, and it probably will be uh, voted into force in early next year, is a regulation on interchange and some caps on interchange in the European market. Now interchange is a fee that's paid from the merchant bank to the cardholder bank. Okay. So every time you use a card, there's an interchange payment that goes on in the background between the two banks. Now that's going to be lowered by regulation in Europe. This is going to cost, and this is a, a Boston Consulting Group su study that came out uh, two weeks ago. This is going to cost European banks 6 billion euros a year. Okay, 6 billion euros a year. They're going to lose now in revenues because of this regulation. There's also what we call a Payment Services Directive, PSD. We already had one that's trying to equalize the regulation of payments in, in the various markets in Europe. Uh, the second one is coming out, and it's again meant to do more to equalize the payments world, but it's also going to introduce um, some new rules around a third-party payment provider. And this is a potentially disruptive regulation. So let me just say, try and show what a third-party payment provider is. Um, you may have used uh, services where if you have multiple bank accounts, you can enter your details into a service provider and they will screen scrape, as it's called, and they can present all your statements on one website, right? You go in. Now, the third-party payment providers will do the same thing to access your bank account with the credentials you're given them and post a credit transfer on the account to push money to whoever you've authorized them to do, okay? Now, with faster payments, that means if you're in a merchant outlet and you authorize them to do this, they can see, ding, the money's in there straight away. So they don't have to use the card payments networks anymore. So these third-party payment providers can really disrupt the, the retail point-of-sale environment if and when they come into force. Um, but they're being put in place by the regulator now. They put some wording around security features and um, they're not allowed to store sensitive information. On the other hand, the banks un have to um, process those transactions as any other transaction, so they can't prevent them or try and block them. And the TPPs also have to present themselves to the banks and say, I'm TPPX, I'm going to go in and I'm going to post a transaction on this consumer's account. So they have, there has to be transparency if you want to round the regulation. So TPPs is actually a major innovative step that's been put in place and enabled by the regulators because banks previously did not allow access except from the consumer himself to post uh, transactions on the account. So let me use the last bit to say, well, what about beyond payments? And that's probably a lot of what um, people are talking about in this conference and how will that be affected by regulation? Well, uh, American Express did a study a couple of years ago where they looked at the total value of the industry of payments and they said the actual payments itself, the processing of it and the revenues you can generate from it, it's about a hundred billion dollars a year. But the data around payments is about four to five times that. So. $500 billion a year is the potential of the big data that sits around the payments. So most people are looking from that green area to the blue area and say, whoa, there is opportunity there for us. Let's go out and do something. But there's a bit of a problem with that, a fly in the ointment when it comes to regulation in this space and that we're seeing in the European Union. And again, actually, which you've also seen here in Turkey, there is a Data Privacy Act that has been 
drafted here in Turkey. Nothing has happened the last couple of years. But my guess is, once we see the next step in Europe, they may well be picking it up again. Because the regulators have their own network, and they share their experiences between themselves, and tend to move uh, in, in synchronization, if you want. But um, over a quarter of social network users, and uh, even fewer online uh, shoppers, 18%, feel in total control of their data. So 80% feel they're not in control of their personal data when they go online and they do stuff, right? 74% of Europeans see disclosing personal information as an increasing part of modern life. And by the way, they don't like it, right? We don't like all this information being out there used by companies looking at us. And the rest of the statistics go down to a final conclusion. is 90% of Europeans want the same data protection rights across the whole of the EU. So the, so the European Union are using that now to start to propose some new regulations. And so, data privacy. Let me give you two war stories on data privacy, and you may well have heard at least one of them. But Target in the US is a major retail chain, okay? And they had this guy, middle-aged guy, come up very angry and said he wanted to see the store manager of his local Target store. And the store manager came out and he said, I want to know what your company is doing. You're sending marketing materials to my 17-year-old daughters about baby clothes, nappies, all kinds of stuff. What the hell are you up to, right? This is absolutely unacceptable. And the store manager went, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll get in contact with head office and I'll make sure we stop this immediately. Same guy came back the next day and asked to see the store manager. And he said, I have to apologize. You knew something I didn't. And that was his wife and his daughter knew she was pregnant, but he didn't. And the reason they knew was because she brought shampoo and soap without sort of smelly materials in them, right? Which women apparently do. So they, through the big data, knew already that she was pregnant before he even had an idea. That's the type of information we're talking about. Now, the second example I'm going to mention is, how many here have an iPhone? Quite a few. Do you use Siri, any of you? No, not really. You're a unique market then. But Siri, if you went through, when you clicked, I accept everything Apple has put in there, Siri, um, Apple rather, stores every command given to Siri for two years in the cloud somewhere. One year, they say, they store it with a reference to your phone. So they know every command your phone gave to Siri. And if we believe them, they delete that reference after a year. Uh, but they still have it for another year. Okay? That's on like page 77 of this, you know, I accept all this stuff when you leave through it on the screen. This is the type of stuff of personal data that the EU is looking at. And one of their proposals is companies will not be allowed to collect any information relating to you unless you opt in. That means there has to be a box where you say, yes, please take all my data, or please take all my Siri commands. It's all right. So this is what we're talking about here. So um, whenever consent is required, it must be given explicitly rather than assumed, is how we say it. So you can't just bury it in all this text and say, oh, I told you about it. You have to tick the box. Um, you have to have easy access to your own data. So you should be able to call anyone that you've given a right to the data and say, please show me the data you have, actually, because I'm a bit concerned now. You will have a right to be forgotten. So when you regret that you allowed Apple to keep your, your uh, information, you should be able to call them up and say, just delete me. Delete everything, and Apple must do it. Okay? Um, and any serious data breaches will have to be um, communicated to you. So what does that mean for the payments business? And what does that mean for the $500 billion that we're going out there to look for or trying to get? Well, cloud computing. You know, where, how safe is it out there? Data breaches. There's a few actresses that are a bit nervous about personal photos that have gone out there. You know, cloud isn't that safe. Um, smartphone apps and advertising. So the ability to track everywhere you go on the phone, give these personalized offers, again, you have to get the consumer to agree to allow people to do that. Currently, that is an assumed right. And the app will just take your information. 
And the location-based services, so when you're walking through a store and they want to drag, uh, draw your attention to some special offers over here on the, on the right shelf, that also you have to agree to and turn on and make sure that you actually are in control of those offers coming to you. It changes a lot of the propositions that we have out there. So with five sec oh, I'm six seconds over, I can see now. But just in conclusion then, um, what's going to happen then in Europe with the regulation that we've seen, and which I predict is probably going to be tur the Turkish market in another three, four, five years, because like the uh, e-money license and the uh, payments institution license regulation, there seems to be a trend to follow, what EU sets the trend for. Um, will reduced issuer income reduce innovation? So will banks not become the drivers of innovation? As if they were. Um, but with six billion dollars less, re oh, sorry, euros less revenue a year in Europe, I don't think they're going to be that innovative. The question is, when will these third-party payments providers create a real alternative to card payments in the marketplace? I'm pretty sure it's going to happen, and that's going to revolutionize a lot of the payments that we currently see. And there's a question around what is the commercial model for that type of payment going to become? We're not sure yet. Uh, and will value-added services lead to innovation around payments? I'm pretty sure they will. And I, th I see a lot of uh, interesting ideas coming up about these value-added services. But again, it's going to depend on data privacy, the opt-in of the consumer in Europe. In other places, you can still just take data and do with it what you want. Um, but the real question is, who's going to pay for that innovation? and those services. And most likely, it's not going to be consumers. It's going to have to be the retailers who pay for it. So the funding of innovation, I think, largely around this space is going to come from the retail community deriving value around the information with payments. So that was all I had to say. Thank you very much for your attention.